goes up secretly at first and he oh I should have put the verse where does he say it oh here it is um in verse 37 on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. This, I think, is one of these beautiful things because we thirst in a physical sense when we're hot, when we need water, but there's a deeper sense of a spiritual thirst when we need life. And Jesus answers, come to me and drink. Find in him the satisfaction of our desire. Find in him maybe the desire that leads us toward eternal life. He talks about streams of living water will flow from within him. There is a deep sense that communion with God leads to life in the heart, leads to life on the inside. And it's amazing to look at the people around you and to start asking, who is really alive? Because I know some people uh, that very much fall into what Gimli says in Lord of the Rings, another great book that has lots of lines of wisdom, there's more cheer in a graveyard. You know, there's, there's people and our culture is filled with them. Lots of young people that are very lost today. When you look at the faces of these people that protest on college campuses, what you see is anger and rage and bitterness and upset. And it's like, they're not really living. That's not much to live for. You just want to be angry and upset at everything and burn it to the ground. Okay. But that's not a good way to live. And it's really amazing to meet people in the other direction. People that have, would have every reason to be angry and bitter in their lives, and you encounter them and they're grateful. And they're just kind of humble, and they chug along. And it's like, you could have lots of reasons, you have lots of things going wrong in your life, and yet you're really alive. One of the differences is this gift of living water, is the gift of the Holy Spirit in the heart. Many of you know, and I think it's a significant problem in our culture, and we all have battles at different times with despair. It's a very interior thing. It's very, very cloudy. You know, one of the things that is in Harry Potter that um, J.K. Rowling does really well is the description of dementors. They're these creatures that sort of suck all the joy and light out of a room. And it's an analogy for depression and despair. She says that when she writes about the book. Not to say that the books are perfect, but she does a really good job of describing that kind of thing that happens and how that attitude and that mentality, being in the presence of one of these beings, can suck all the joy out of life, can suck all the joy out of our hearts. That happens. Despair is very, very real. And it has a tendency to kind of sneak up on us and we don't realize it right away. Another one of the great words for our culture today is dissipation. Being spread too thin. Um, gosh, there's all kinds of analogies that are really great with this, but I better move on. Shoot. Um, but being spread too thin, think of how many people today are busy. And they're busy with so many things. And again, you have to ask the question, are they really alive? Sometimes they look like zombies. I mean, you know, like the zombie apocalypse, people will talk about that and it's kind of this weird thing and sort of tongue in cheek. But there's a lot of zombies that walk around. They spend time and they zip from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And at the end of the day, they just kind of crash and burn. And, you know, there, it's like there's not a person that's there as much. Because when you encounter them, what you encounter is they're tired. And they can't, they don't have the capacity to express the same kind of joy or to enter into connection with other people. And this is something I think we need to be cautious about. It's very, very easy in the world we live in to become dissipated. 
to become spread too thin and to try and do too many things. The Holy Spirit brings real rest to our hearts, brings a new power, a new grace, new energy, and restoration. When you look at someone like St. John Paul II, he was famous for being able to keep a schedule that made everyone around him tired. And so he had like more than one secretary, or more than one traveling companion because he could keep going. Why could he do that? I think it's one of these gifts of the Holy Spirit that it came from communion, that it was a divine gift, a divine grace of God. Sometimes we need new life after dry times. Rain in the desert is one of the really great images to think of because some of you have wintered in Arizona in different times. You know that actually if the desert get rain, gets rain, it blooms. And there's times where our hearts feel very much like the desert, very sandy and not much is happening. The gift of the Holy Spirit, living water, can make even deserts bloom. And that's another important theme for our lives. Because when you feel like you're a desert, when your heart feels like it's a desert, when we get stuck in some of those things, it certainly doesn't feel like it's going to change or that it could be different. But the desert blooms. In chapter 14, um, Jesus has this kind of extended discourse on the promise of the Holy Spirit. It starts in, cha in uh, chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever the spirit of truth. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you desolate. I will come to you. You can see this passage as I lay it out here. Um, the place where there's dots, I skipped a little bit because, like I said, you just have to start picking and choosing. Otherwise, you like put the whole scripture in your notes and then they're not really notes and they're not really useful for anything. If your notes get too long, they're not notes. <laughs> they could be a book, they could be a treatise, but they're not notes. Um, so it, he talks about keeping the commandments. And I think this means more than just obeying them. But how do you keep God's commandments? How do you hold on to them? How do you grab on to them? You know, is keeping just external things alone? The answer is no. Some of you had this experience raising children. There's times where they followed the rules, but they did so grudgingly. Their hearts weren't in it. Did they really keep the rule? Did they really do what you wanted them to? The answer is very often no. And as soon as you were out of the picture, the rule went to pieces. So keeping the commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he will give us a counselor. This is that word paraclete, advocate, counselor, someone to lead us rightly, someone to poke us when we're on the wrong path. Sometimes I think someone to whack us in the head when we need that. Sometimes God isn't gentle. And it's a good thing. It's okay to pray that the Lord isn't always gentle. Even the spirit of truth, we've talked about that theme before. I will not leave you desolate. This is that encounter with the Holy Spirit that living water leads us out of despair. And I think it's worth saying that there still are mental struggles and there still are battles. There will still be times where you face depression that can feel very lonely and very isolating. It's not that life in the Holy Spirit is a cure-all. And like you take the magic pill, I pray to the Holy Spirit and everything goes away. Like, no, God doesn't usually do that. He can, but he doesn't usually do that. Some of these things are things that we have to fight against or work against. We have to like do what is good, what is in the right direction, with the trust that even if it doesn't feel like it in the moment, Feeding your humanity good things is good for it. 
you know, they talk about uh, basics, you know, eat regular meals, get regular exercise, work at spending time with friends, get out of your house, you know, do things with other people. Because depression, despair, desolation feels very isolating. You feel very alone. And it's really, well, I don't feel like going out. And it's true, you might not feel like it, but that kind of feeling isn't leading you toward restoration. That kind of feeling is leading you toward yourself and toward loneliness. So sometimes there's a gift and we can pray and God really does lift it. He can change things on a dime and we should ask for that. But there's other times where him changing things and his work is more gradual and is inside of us and we have to do our part too because he wants our hearts. He wants to change us from the inside out. And sometimes it's good just to turn to scripture. Like pull out this passage. This is John chapter 14. Jesus, you said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not leave you desolate. I feel desolate. Like where is your promise in my life? Scripture is good that way. Like they're your words, not my words. And so we ask him to fulfill them. Because I live, you will live. In the Holy Spirit, we have life. This is another one of those lines that almost gives me goosebumps every time because when you think of just that theme of life and how many people, like I said, are zombies and how many people don't live, you think this passage, yet a little while and the world will see me no more. He will look like he's dead. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that the Holy Spirit gives the apostles this knowledge, this confidence, um, that he is in the Father, that there is this relationship. If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is dwelling in the heart. This is that work of grace that is beautiful that the Holy Spirit does, that God wants to change us from the inside out. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, will teach you all things. We have more to learn, more than just what Jesus says alone. Jesus also speaks of the gift of peace. When we talk about the fruits of the Holy Spirit in a little bit with St. Paul, we're going to encounter this. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. These are some of the things that the Holy Spirit can bring. And this last line, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's almost like Jesus knows that one of the temptations that we face is toward fear, is toward anxiety. And praying for this gift of peace, for God's peace, the Holy Spirit to touch those areas of our hearts, sometimes it takes more than just the Holy Spirit alone. Sometimes it takes openness to a friend or talking to a pastor or a priest about what is happening on the inside. You know, some of these things that are going on. It's really amazing, for instance, they say for people that are on the path to suicide, having someone to talk to, just to listen to them, makes a significant difference in the number of people that actually go through with it. You might think that talking about the bad stuff and talking about their feelings or their desire not to live isn't going to help them, but actually the opposite is true. Fewer of them commit suicide. The same thing is true for us, that talking about the darkness, talking about the stuff that feels like shadow monsters on the inside can feel like it's not going to help or it's not leading us in the right direction. But talking about it, sharing your heart with someone feeling supported and heard can make a significant difference. It's like Jesus knows that we need that and the Holy Spirit is part of this push. He talks about the Holy Spirit bringing to mind or memory. This is that sacred remembrance that I mentioned before, anamnesis, um, that God draws us into a present, into an eternal reality that's beyond just what happens. Sometimes this happens 
as a gift, for instance, as you're preparing for confession. All of a sudden you'll be reminded of a sin or something that happened in your life from a long time ago. That can be a kind of sacred memory that God is bringing up something that you can bring to him. You might not have thought about it in 20 years or 30 years. And there's a kind of memory. Sometimes maybe you pray and you really feel like you enter into one of the mysteries that we're celebrating of the life of Jesus, or you really connect with him being placed in the tomb or another spot. That's sacred memory. The Holy Spirit is given to us to help make us courageous and unafraid, to be a kind of power in the heart, a supernatural confidence. This is also something that we have to work at. I wish it would just sort of descend on us from above, but very often it's repeated and it has to become a well-worn path of confidence and of trust. In chapter 15, it gives us another image of remaining in Christ and keeping his commandments. It talks about the vine and the branches. To live in love and communion, to bear fruit. And this is a very, very real image. It's a good thing. You practice this all the time when you weed the garden, because I'm sure you've said you got to pull it down and get the roots, because if you just take off the top, it grows back. It doesn't grow back quite as quickly as you usually make people believe it does. You really do set the weeds back if you cut off their tops. But if you want to get rid of them, you do have to pull out the root. But it's because the life of the root is the life of the branches. This is what Jesus is talking about, the life of the vine, the life of the branches. That it's through remaining in him, remaining attached to him, through conversion and repentance and all these other things, that we actually are able to bear fruit. If we're cut off from him, if you cut off a vine from the branches, the branches wither and die because they don't have roots. Another very, very good thing. When the tree branch breaks off and falls on your driveway, you chop it off the tree. Now, in some cases, you can replant it if you want a second tree, and it'll grow new roots, but you chop it off the tree because when it's off the tree, it dies. And what Jesus is saying, what he's encouraging us to do is to use that image to understand our spiritual lives, to understand our life in him. One of the things that can happen with prophecy, and we'll talk more about prophecy and that word of knowledge as we dive into St. Paul, but very often we want it to be about future things. The temptation toward wanting to know what's coming in the future is strong, and it's strong for all of us. We have a desire to know what comes next in our lives, what choice to make, what direction to go, what is the best thing. In Christ, in the Holy Spirit, sometimes there is a future component to prophecy, but it tends to be far more rare than we would like. Prophecies tend to be about the present moment, about confidence and faith here and now, and not so much about the future. There are times where God does let us know about the future, but it's not as common. So there's just something to keep in mind as we talk about prophecy, as we talk about entering into these supernatural kinds of knowledge that it's probably not going to be about a bunch of future stuff. You're probably not going to love the Holy Spirit and live more deeply with him and he's going to tell you when the end of the world is. Probably not going to happen. Hasn't happened yet. And there's lots of people that have been down that path many times. Lots of us would like to know what's the best choice in our lives. Should we buy this house? Should we buy that house? Should we go here? Should we go there? And future things. And those are rare. God just doesn't share many of them with us. But they can happen. They do happen. Usually if they do, they're a bit more mysterious than that. There are some times where there was very direct future prophecies. Um, Jesus talked about 
the destruction of Jerusalem that would happen after he died. And one of the really amazing stories is how the Christians, by and large, abandoned the city when the Romans were coming because there was this tension in the land in the late 60s up until about 70 AD when the traditional date for the destruction of Jerusalem is. And the Christians, there was this sort of prophetic warning, now is the time to leave. These are the signs that Jesus was talking about. Destruction of the city is coming. And so the Christian community by and large left and went to a place in Jordan called Petra. If you go to the Holy Land now, many tours take you over to Petra um, and you get to see some of it. So that does happen, but it's not that common. In John chapter 20, um, just a couple of things to emphasize very briefly. Jesus says, peace be with you. Again, there's that theme of peace with the Holy Spirit, that God brings peace. This isn't just worldly peace, but St. Augustine has this great phrase, peace is the tranquility of order. And that's a good way to think about it. This is a kind of supernatural peace. When you would have every reason to be concerned or anxious, and you're not, you're able to approach it with equanimity and trust in the Lord. That's the kind of peace. Not just, well, I feel more peace about this or I don't feel more peace about this. Like, that can happen, but what the New Testament is usually talking about is a supernatural gift. Like Jesus, you know, pulling Peter out of the water when Peter's trying to walk on the water and there's just this kind of supernatural peace. I'm with Jesus, it's okay that he didn't have a moment before when he was sinking and panicking. Jesus says, as the Father sends me, so I send you. There is, part of the gift of the Holy Spirit is being sent. It's not for us alone. It's for the world. It's for other people. It's a gift for more than just me and you. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit he breathes on them. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And you see, again, this beautiful tie to the sacramental life, to confession, um, to the gift of peace. Part of the gift of peace is bringing freedom from sin, freedom from attachments and worldly desires. Um, and that's, that's one of the great works of the Holy Spirit as well. So these are a few themes from the Gospel of John, I think, where we can find some evidence, some, some of these works of the Holy Spirit that he does. Um, oh. I've been debating, I think for next time as we get, dive into St. Paul, I think what I'm going to try to do is instead of following specific passages, we'll talk about things and they'll reference some passages. And I haven't done all the work of finding that yet. So I can't tell you what to read for next time, but watch your email and I'll send it out in the next couple of days. Um, so I'll try to get it to you before Thursday. That'll be a good deadline for me. Um, like I'll just try and map out, but it'll probably be themes and the verses or the passages will jump into different places. Sometimes I try to pick out something. I do know if you want something to look at to start with, um, Paul's letters to the Corinthians are going to be important because he brings out lots of the work of the Holy Spirit in those letters to the Corinthians. So if you wanted to start reading something, that's what I would start with, our Paul's first and second letter to the Corinthians, um, because we're going to be in the Corinthians in Paul's letters. Let us pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.